going to be reading from Psalm 25 this morning. <clears throat> my eyes are ever on the Lord, for only He release, will release my feet from the snare. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. Relieve the troubles of my heart and free me from my anguish. Look on my affliction and my distress and take away all my sins. See how numerous are my enemies and how fiercely they hate me. Guard my life and rescue me. Do not let me be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. Will I believe you when you say Your hand will guide my every way Will I receive the word you say Every moment of every day Will I, will walk by faith Even when I cannot see because this broken road prepares your will for me. Help me to rid my endless fears. You've been so faithful for all my years. With one breath you make me feel. Your grace covers all I do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I will walk by faith, even when I cannot see. Oh, because this broken road prepares your will for me. Well, I'm broken. But I still see your face Well, you've spoken Pouring your words of praise Oh, why will walk by faith Even when I cannot see Oh, because this broken road your will for me. Oh, I will walk by faith, even when I cannot see. Oh, because this broken road prepares your will for me. Well, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. I will walk by faith, I will walk by faith, I will walk by faith, I will walk by faith. Luke's account of Palm Sunday, I want to first give you the prophetic and allegorical backdrop to this event. It'll raise the story to a level of significance that it really wouldn't have otherwise. Now, by the grace of God, I'm going to try not to complicate things. Bible teachers do us no favors when they uh, blind us with theological complexities. To see the prophetic perspective, we have to go back to around 500 years before the birth of Jesus, okay, which was during the Babylonian captivity. Uh, that is, the Jews were captive in uh, Babylon at the time. It's during this time that the prophet Daniel receives one of the most significant messages in the entire Bible. In Daniel chapter 9, the angel Gabriel says, Daniel... From the decree to rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah comes, 
shall be 483 years. And it was on March 14th, 445 B.C., that Artaxerxes, the king of Babylon, actually gave the decree and told the Jews they could go back now and begin to rebuild Jerusalem. So remember, the angel said from that time, from that decree, there would be 483 years until the Messiah arrived. Uh, so if you take that decree and we calculate the years using the Jewish calendar, which gave only 30 months, 30 days, that is, per month, different than ours, Using that formula, we find Jesus riding into Jerusalem on April the 6th, A.D. 32. I mean, right down to the exact day of 483 years. Exactly to the day. Now, this is the day we now observe as Palm Sunday. So, you can begin to see the significance of Palm Sunday. A lot of times we don't think about it because we don't really know the back story. And that's just the prophetic side of it. Now, we're going to switch and look at the allegorical perspective as to the backdrop of this great event called the Triumphal Entry, that which we call Palm Sunday today. And it's, it's, really, it's a really beautiful thing when you see it. To see the spiritual revelation of Palm Sunday, we must first go back to the first Jewish Passover. Because the Passover corresponds with the crucifixion of Jesus. But the only way to know that is we have to go back to the first Passover. The first Passover occurred in Egypt when the Jews were held in bondage in Egypt. Notice we're going back to when they're in captivity once again. To understand the prophetic side of it, we had to go to when they were captive in Babylon. Now we're going back to when they were in bondage in Egypt. You know, which I think is significant that we get these these amazing prophecies and these messages when they're in bondage. Because if you'll think about it, it's the same way with us in our lives. It's, it's when we're in bondage, it's when we're captive to some addiction, some problem, when we're in bondage to some tribulation or some trial, when we're going through something hard. It's in those times that we cry out to God you know, for deliverance like the Jews did. And it's in those times that we receive a message from God, that we'll receive a revelation from God, that He'll speak to our heart, that He'll, He'll strengthen our faith. It's in those times that we grow in the Lord. And we find that with the nation of Israel, it was the same thing. We're always going back to their captivity, to their bondage to get these great messages. So the first Passover occurred when the Jews were down in Egypt. They were in Egypt. They were in bondage. They had been in bondage for over 400 years. And part of God's deliverance to them was that they were instructed on the first month of the Jewish calendar, a month called Nisan. And the tenth day of the first month, they were to select a lamb from among their lambs. They were to select one without defect. It had to be a perfect lamb, without blemish. And they were to bring it into the house with them for four days and live with that lamb for four days. But on the fifth day, in the evening time, they were to slay the lamb as a sacrifice and put the blood over the doorpost. And that way, God told Moses and the people that when the death angel passed through Egypt, because this was the last, the tenth and last plague, as God tried to get Pharaoh to, to let the children of Israel go, he kept refusing, you remember, plague after plague would be sent. And every time a plague was sent, Moses would give him another chance. Are you ready now to release the people? And he would harden his heart, and God would send another plague. So the last plague was, God said, I'm going to kill all the firstborn in Egypt. But he said, Moses, you can spare the children of Israel by telling them to go on the first day and the tenth day of the first month, select a lamb without blemish, bring it in, live with it in your home for four days, and at evening on the fifth day, slay the lamb, put the blood over the doorpost, and when the death angel passes through Egypt, he's been instructed that every door he goes to, wherever the blood of the lamb is, he passes over that home and goes to the next one. Thus, it gets the name the Passover. And so they did that. And as a result, there was what we call today the midnight cry. You know, this, this is where that term comes from. At midnight... The, the death angel passed through and killed all the firstborn in Egypt, but he spared the Jewish children because the blood was over the doorpost. 
And of course, this was the plague that finally broke Pharaoh. It broke that hardened heart. It didn't break it in repentance, but God broke him down to the point he finally relented and he let the children of Israel go. You know, and the same applies to us. The Bible says, speaks of how that, that some people are often reproved by God, but they stiffen themselves. They stiffen their neck, the Bible says. And it says those who are often reproved yet remain stiff-necked, it said they will eventually be broken and that without remedy. Which means if we don't yield ourselves while God is speaking to us, while there's punishment and there's correction coming, if we just hold you know, to our pride and we, we try to be stern and we don't do it our way as a human being instead of yielding to God, the Bible says eventually God will come one last time and He'll just break that person and they won't be able to recover. The Bible says fall on the rock called Jesus while we can. It says or the rock will eventually fall on us and grind us to powder. So this is what happened in Egypt. He couldn't get Pharaoh to humble himself and turn the people loose. He wanted to keep them as slaves. But finally the killing of the firstborn did it. So this is where the first Passover occurred. And they were instructed every year to repeat this as a memorable thing, as a ceremony. And they were to reenact this. And of course, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, it was during the Passover. His death corresponded with that. Because He was considered our Passover lamb. And here is, here is the great revelation in it, the allegory that I wanted to share with you. This is amazing. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem. It was 483 years to the day that the prophecy had been given. It fulfilled it to the exact day because he rode in, in all actuality, on April the 6th, 32 AD, which, if you check it with the Jewish calendar, at that time, it was Nisan the 10th on the Jewish calendar. The first month, the 10th day of the month, is when Jesus rode in. See, remember, God told Moses, said, select a lamb without blemish on the 10th day of the first month and bring it into the home with you. Jesus rode into Jerusalem the 10th day of the first month on the Jewish calendar. Isn't that something? God had chosen Jesus as the lamb, the Passover lamb for us. And it was Passover at that very time in Israel. And, and just as they were to keep that lamb for four days in their home before they killed it as a sacrifice, Jesus spent the next four days in the temple in God's house preaching the gospel and teaching the people. See, just like the Passover lamb, it just lines up perfectly. And then on the evening of the fifth day, we find that on what we call Good Friday, you know, in most of the liturgical churches, Jesus was slain as that lamb. And just as they had to down in Egypt choose a lamb without blemish, a perfect lamb, we know that Jesus was a perfect lamb. He had no sin in His life. See, the blemishes on the lambs was a type of sin in the life of the people. And so God had to find a person, a lamb, that had no blemish, that is, no sin in their life, and only Jesus could do that. So we find that Jesus was our Passover lamb and he was slain right at the time that they were slaying the lambs in Israel for Passover. See, it's not by chance all that worked out exactly that way. It's not by chance. Somebody could say, well, Frank, Jesus and his disciples may have planned for him to come into Israel right at Passover, you know. But the thing is, his disciples didn't even know he was going to die. They were all upset when he kept trying to tell them this was going to happen. Only Jesus knew. Somebody could say, well, Jesus planned it to be on Passover to make himself look like the lamb. Well, he couldn't have planned the 483 years right down to the day. He couldn't plan his own birth. He was born right at that time. And at age 33, he was taken to the cross. And he was killed as a lamb in our place. This is why we call Him a substitutionary sacrifice. Because see, the Bible said the wages of sin is death. You know, the Bible calls the Law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, we know that as the moral law. You know, and as you hear Ray Comfort say so often on YouTube, we've broken God's law. We've all broken the Ten Commandments. 
Uh, most of us have probably broken all of them. I know I have many times in my life. And so we're all guilty before God of breaking His law. And just like any good judge, He's got to exact a penalty for that. Even in the world today, we wouldn't consider a judge to be worth anything if he didn't require justice, if he didn't enforce the law. But he does. A good judge requires payment for breaking the law. And God is a good and righteous judge. And so he, he declared from the start the wages of sin is death. But yet God is also rich in mercy. And He loves us. So He had a dilemma on His hand. How does He exact justice and maintain His integrity as a righteous judge and at the same time show mercy? How does He do it? See, the answer is Jesus. That's how He did it. So you can see today that the you know, the whole event of Palm Sunday is really an amazing event. And it has many more layers than we, we realize at first glance, right? Because once you know the prophetic aspect, once you know the allegorical aspect, the revelation of it, you can see today that it's really a phenomenal thing and it's something worth observing. Okay, let's pick it up now in Luke 19, chapter 19, verse 36. We're going to real quickly look at uh, Luke's narrative of this event. That'll be page 974 in your church Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, you're welcome to grab one of the church Bibles back there off the table. In chapter 19, starting with verse 36 in the Gospel of Luke, it, said, it says, And as he rode along, that's Jesus riding on the donkey, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. Now here where it says the whole multitude of his disciples, it's not talking about the twelve disciples, you know, disciple just comes from the word discipline or those who have been disciplined by a teacher. These are just people that follow Jesus. These is the, it calls them a multitude because these are the people that have, that have attached themselves to His following as He's gone through Israel working miracles, raising the dead, opening the eyes of the blind, and stopping the deaf ears, cleansing the lepers, preaching to the poor. A great multitude of people as a result has assembled around Jesus and begun to follow Him. You remember on one occasion He had to, through a miracle, He had to feed 5,000 people, you know, from a couple of fish and a few loaves of bread. So He's got a lot of people and it tells us here that this was a great multitude and they're going out, it says in verse 36, and they're putting their cloaks down in front of Him as He rides along on the donkey, see? They're honoring Him as the King of Israel. They don't even want His donkey's feet to touch the ground. So they're taking off their cloaks. A cloak was, you know, that was a coat or some extra pullover garment they had back then. And those who had them was putting them on the ground. Uh, we're actually told in Matthew's Gospel that in addition to their cloaks, some people were cutting down palm branches and laying those in front of Jesus as He went along. And uh, verse 38 says this multitude was saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. John's Gospel says they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet Him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Now if you notice here when it says they're crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna was a Jewish word that actually meant save us. And so they were basically... They were acknowledging. See, they called Him the, the King of Israel. They were saying, save us. They were crying out to Him. They were lining the roads. They were following Him. One of the Gospels says they were in front of Him and behind Him. And they were crying out with a loud voice, save us, King of the Jews. Save us. Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. So notice here, the crowd is crying for Him to save them because they're acknowledging that He's the King. See, they, they believed, if you remember, we've talked about this, they believed that when the Messiah came, He would do what? They didn't expect Him to die. Because see, many 
prophecies. I'll tell you this real quick. You've got prophecies that give you two different messages about the Messiah when he comes. One calls him a suffering servant who dies. The other prophecies given, they just call him the king and they, they call him the Messiah who will come like a military leader and will lead a, an army to relieve the Jews of their captors. They were expecting the Messiah to throw off the yoke of the Romans at this time, right? Because the Jews had kind of brushed aside the scriptures that indicated he would suffer, that he would come as a lamb to die for sin. And they, they put together and they just looked at the scriptures that called him a conquering king. And they gave the passages about him coming and, and destroying their enemies and raising them back up as a nation, which he will in the thousand year reign of Christ that we're taught about over there in the book of Revelation. You see what I'm saying? They didn't look at the suffering servant. So here they are saying, save us, king of the Jews. They're, they're excited. They're following him into the city because they believe that's what he's there to do. They don't know that a week later he will be dead. They don't know he'll be killed a week later. And so they're lining the streets and they're following him into the city, cheering him on. They think he's fixing to somehow, you know, because he's been working all these miracles... It's like, well, I don't know how he's going to do it, but he, somehow he's going to destroy these Romans and we're going to be set free and our nation is going to be built up again. and you know, We're going to be empowered, not going to be oppressed. But folks, some of these same people a week later were standing out there crying, crucify Him, crucify Him. See, the Bible says that the religious leaders persuaded them and got them together and they chanted crucify him a week later. That's, that's a good reason for us to never seek the adulation of the people and the crowds and the masses. Don't seek approval from people. People are fickle, especially people of the world that don't have Christ for stability of mind and emotion. People out there in the world, they'll love you one minute and hate you the next. They'll want to raise you up and worship you. You know, if you're a celebrity and you've done something notable, you've got a video that goes viral, they will just about, they will, not just about, they will worship the ground you walk on in some cases. But then you can turn right around and say something that's against their political views or their feelings, and next thing you know, they're ready to kill you. These same people. And see, that it was no different with Jesus. One minute they thought He was going to kill the Romans, you know, and destroy the Romans and set them free. And he was the man. But next thing you know, a week later, when he was arrested, and they're like, what? How is this? This powerful miracle worker, our Messiah, he can't be arrested. He's arrested now. They're flogging him. They're tormenting him. He's getting ready to go to Mount Golgotha and die on a cross. And they're like, no, this, this can't be the Messiah. We've made a mistake. The religious leaders were jealous of him and they were then able to persuade the masses to begin to turn on him and chant crucify him. And that's what they did. 39 tells us, and some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, now here he is, he's marching in there, they're praising him, and the, te the religious leaders said, teacher, rebuke your disciples. See, the Pharisees were angry because the crowds were praising Jesus. They were calling him king of Israel. 40 says, and he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, I would that even you had known on this day the things that make for peace, for now they are hidden from your eyes. So it says here that Jesus, when he finally got into Jerusalem and he looked over the city, he wept. Jesus actually began to break down and cry. And he said, I wish that you knew. I wish you knew the path of peace. I wish that you knew what would bring peace at this time. But notice he says, it's hidden from your eyes. It wasn't he was saying, oh, poor folks, if you could only see it. But he's saying it's hidden. You know, he's tore up. He, he sees the future. He knows what's going to happen to the people. And he's crying about it but he says it's hidden from their eyes. What he means is, if you read Paul's writings later, Paul said that it was God Himself that blinded their eyes where they could not see 
who Jesus was because God had become so upset with the nation. They had abandoned God and they had killed so many of the prophets and had done so much evil that God finally caused them not to be able to recognize Christ. And Paul said it was through the wisdom of God because he intended for the Gentile nations, that is all non-Jewish nations, to have a chance to come to faith in Christ. Because if they had received their Messiah instantly at that time, it would have brought the end of the world. Before we would have had all these many centuries of foreign nations coming to faith and filling the kingdom of heaven with a lot of people from all over the world. So it was part of God's plan. It's, it's like this, you know, we can do wrong, but the Bible says it like this, what the devil means for evil, God will use for good. He'll always bring beauty from ashes, the Bible tells us. And when our life has become what we think is an ash heap sometimes, when everything has gone seemingly wrong and we're going through that dark place, the Bible says He will give us beauty for ashes, but we have to turn over our ashes to God for Him to do that. If we hold on to our ashes and we're determined we're going to put it back together somehow, He can't help us. But if we will in humility turn it up to God and say, God, this is all I have now. My life is an ash heap. You know, I've messed up. I've, I've, I've done so many things and made so many mistakes and somehow it's just all turned out wrong. If we'll humble ourselves and turn our situation over to God, the Bible says He'll bring something beautiful from that. And He will. He will. I, I can tell you of an assurity He'll do it. I'm 57 and I've given Him a few ash heaps in my life. <laughs> and every time... He's worked things out and He's turned things around for me. And He's brought a blessing out of those problems. Hallelujah. Amen. He continues to do it today. Now, as Jesus stood and wept over Jerusalem, notice as we read verse 43 and 44, Jesus begins to prophesy their future. It says in verse 43, for the days, this is Jesus talking, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground and your children within you and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Now you see why he's weeping over Jerusalem. Jesus sees their future. They don't see it. And it doesn't come for 40 years. He's actually prophesying the destruction of Israel that you can go look in your secular history books today and find that occurred in 70 AD under the command of the general known as Titus, the Roman general, who later became emperor of Rome. He came in 40 years, about 40 years after Jesus was crucified. And, and this happened. So, you know, when they first killed Jesus, the sun came up the next day, the birds were singing. They thought everything was okay. Our grandfather once, he said, you know, he said the problem is people sometimes living in sin don't realize that calamity is coming, that payment is coming, that they're going to reap it. He says they sin and then they wake up the next day and he says the birds are singing and the sun is shining. He said they walk outside and they think everything's fine, you know. I did what I did yesterday or last week and the sun came up again and I hear the birds singing and all is well. He said that can be very deceptive. And it was that way for Rome, you know, and the Jews at that time. They crucified the Lord and 40 years passed. But at the end of that 40 years, Titus rolls in with an army and he destroys Jerusalem, burns the temple, and Jesus, what He said came to pass when He said not one stone will be left on another. If you go back and search it out in history, you find that they literally went in there and they broke every stone apart from another stone because the temple became so hot when it was being burned that gold had run down the rocks and the stones and had gotten between them. And they wanted to extract every bit of gold they could and they tore them stones apart. And not one was left connected to another. Jesus said all of this happened because they didn't recognize their day of visitation. So let me say this in closing this morning. Whatever we do this morning, let me encourage you guys 
Let's not miss our day of visitation. It's a very sobering statement that Jesus makes right here at the end, saying all these things are coming because they missed the day of their visitation. See, what was the day of visitation? It was their rescue. The one was there. Jesus said, if you only knew what would bring you peace, if they had only received Him at that time, all of this would have been called off. I don't know about you, but I've actually had instances in my life where I'd be about to do something, and I'd hear the little voice say, don't do it. <laughs> Something in here would be grieved. I'd feel it. Especially back in my younger days. When you're young, your passions are raging. you got lots of energy. Everything still works good in your body. You're not yet having mystery pains and problems. And getting drunk doesn't uh, give you as bad of a hangover. You know, when you're young, you can stay up all night long and party. But even back then, something would tell me, don't do it. This is not right. See, what was it? It was my day of visitation. It was my visitation. It was the Spirit of the Lord. Because He loves us. And He was trying to save me from the pain that was coming. He said, don't do it, Frank. Don't go out and drink all night. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't deceive. Don't do all the things. I'm not going to mess up a good service by talking about all the things I used to do. But it was my day of visitation. And back then, more often than not, I didn't listen to the voice. And I did it anyway. And like the Jews here, I suffered the consequences. Great calamity used to come into my life. Had many major problems, sorrows, run-ins with the police, the law, fights, hangovers, sicknesses, all kinds of stuff. But one day, he didn't give up on me. He kept visiting me. Ever so often, he would come back around after he let me suffer for a while. He would eventually recycle and come back around and basically say, have you had enough yet? And one day I bent the knee before the cross and I said, yes, Lord, I've had enough. If I don't, I'm going to be completely destroyed before it's over because he was pursuing me. I belong to him. So if you're having problems today and there's a voice telling you, don't do it. There's a reason for these problems. You can do better. It's because you belong to the Lord. Be thankful that He's allowing trouble to come into your life, to shake you, to get your attention, to bring you to a place of repentance. Amen. Because without it, oh, I don't, even, I don't even want to think about the alternative. To be lost, it's hard to imagine. So come to the Lord. Come to the Lord if He's calling you today. And as Celestria comes back up to send us off with a song, if there's... If there's anybody here this morning and you want to dedicate your life to the Lord, I encourage you to do it. And you're welcome to step forward this morning if you like. You don't have to. You can give your heart to God right there in the seat. You say, Frank, I've already given my heart to the Lord before. I'm already a Christian. Well, you may just want to rededicate yourself to the Lord to a closer, more devoted walk. If you want to do that this morning, you can do that right where you're sitting. Let's all bow our heads this morning. And those who want to do that, just pray to the Lord this morning and rededicate yourselves. Pray with me and I'll lead us in a prayer. But if you prefer, you can come forward. Yes, sir. And I'll be glad to pray with you. You can come down to the altar. Heavenly Father, we come before you today. And we repent of our sins. We want you to save our souls. And deliver us from the wrath to come. As you talk of in your, your very word. As the Bible says, Jesus. We wait for the revelation of Jesus. Who saves us from the wrath to come. Lord, save us from judgment day. Save us from the, the intermediary judgment days. That come along in the interim, Lord. Before the main judgment day, we, we suffer so many judgments and problems. Save us, Father, from our own destructive decisions. 
Help us to rededicate our lives to you this morning. Help us, Lord, increase our faith. Help us to walk with you in a way that's constructive, that puts us in your will. For, Lord, we know that your Bible teaches that your provision is in your will. And if we're in your will, you'll provide for us. Things will begin to work out. For your word tells us all the paths of God are peace. Bring us into your path, Father, so that we can experience that peace. It's in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Excuse me, brother. If you want to keep your heart open, no, I'm okay, okay. I was going to say, I pray with you if you need me to. Does anybody, before we close out, like for me to pray with them personally this morning? You're welcome to come forward. I just got stuff going on in my life that I need to work out. I understand. Man, we're glad you're here with us this morning. All right. Well, if every heart is clear this morning, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Celestria. She sends us off with a song. Thank you.